Good afternoon and welcome to another great Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 600 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. As always, we want to get started by giving you a chance to win one of our very popular Technation t-shirts. And this week's trivia question is going to be, Rigel, our sponsor today, is headquartered in Florida. Which city hosts a major NASCAR event every year in that state? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to save the date for the next MD Expo conference, which will be April 4th through 6th, 2018 in Nashville, Tennessee. This will be three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. You can find out more about this conference by visiting mdexposhow.com. All right, let's see who this week's winner is. It's going to be Dennis Austin. Congratulations. You knew that Daytona was the correct answer. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Rival Medical. Rival Medical is a leading manufacturer of biomedical test equipment, including electrical safety analyzers, vital sign simulators, infusion pump analyzers, electrosurgical analyzers, and Medi-based asset management software. For more information on this company, please visit rigelmedical.com forward slash USA. Our presenters today are Jack Barrett, National Business Development Manager, and Rebecca Adkins, Biomedical Sales Engineer at Rigel Medical. Jack, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you to, for the, to the Tech Nation team for giving us this opportunity. And technology is a wonderful thing when it works. There we go. So the, uh, the star of today's presentation will be the latest generator from Covidian Medtronic Valley Lab, the FT10. And if you're not aware, this is the replacement generator for the Force Triad. Clearly looks a little bit different. It is 30% lighter in weight. It's smaller. And as you can see, has one touch screen rather than the three that you had on the Force Triad. And the screen is divided into four different quadrants, each associated with a energy output port. So you have monopolar one in the upper left-hand corner, monopolar two, upper right-hand corner, bipolar, lower left side, and ligature on the lower right-hand side. Taking a quick look at the back of the unit, there are four foot switch connectors, two for the monopolar, the standard four pin on monopolar one. Monopolar two has the six pin connector for um, use with the Valley Lab foot switch and pencil. The bipolar is the standard three pin. And you'll notice that there's only one ligature port, and that is the purple. Covidian does have available a little pigtail cable to utilize the orange cable for ligature. And there's also a pigtail cable available to go from the uh, six pin on monopolar two to the, uh, the standard four pin. Down towards the bottom center is the two interlink cables for screen blanking and smoke evacuation. There is the internet cable and Wi-Fi, which is currently not, uh, uh, not energized in the unit. So discussion for today, we're going to uh, just touch very briefly on some of the basics of electrical surgery, touch on the 6601-2-2 standard and talk about preventive maintenance steps. We'll go through and show a test. We'll be using some video in conjunction with today's presentation. So we'll show uh, the actual REM test being conducted. We'll switch over and go to power output testing. 
And the, the good news, I guess, for all the biomeds on the phone today is that the number of power output steps or tests have been reduced from the force triad to this unit. Then we'll look at high frequency leakage testing, the cross coupling testing, and then closing remarks. All our questions we handled at that, uh, that point. So first, of course, the retro surgery is an RF generator within the ESU unit itself, and it cuts or coagulates the tissue based on the waveform. The FT10 is operating at a switching, switching frequency of 434 kilohertz. So you'll see that in the frequency spectrum up here in the right-hand side of the graph. Then there's two types of electrosurgery. surgery. There's monopolar and bipolar. Monopolar uses the patient return pad and it's much larger in size physical dimension than the tip of the pencil that actually does the, uh, the cutting or coagulating of the tissue. And the reason for that is certainly to disperse the current energy over a wider surface so you don't develop patient burns. The second is bipolar, and this uh, refers to ligature as well. And the best way to picture that, of course, is just to think of a pair of tweezers where the active electrode and the dissipative electrode are very close together and the energy passes between the two. So surgeons have over time categorized ESU modes by the changes to the structure of the cells, whether it's desiccation or coagulation. But from an electrical engineering perspective, there really is a difference in the waveforms that the generator outputs to the tissue and the shape of the waveform determines the type of um, changes to the tissue, whether it's desiccation or coagulation. In cut mode, tissue is vaporized and desiccated when the electrode from the pencil itself touches the, uh, the tissue. And in fulguration, the pencil is held above the tissue a little bit, and uh, it actually looks like little lightning bolts going from the tip of the pencil down to the patient's tissue. And then coag, um, again, this is just a, a different waveform, and it would be the drying of the tissue for desiccation, and again, there's a fulguration option on this as well. So we spoke that there's different waveforms that causes the different uh, cellular structure to the tissues. A sinusoidal curve is with constant amplitude is the cutting waveform. And again, the frequency of the pulse width modulation here is 434 kilohertz. For coagulation, the amplitude of the waveform varies. So you see almost a sinusoidal pattern riding on the waveform, and that is what causes coagulation to the tissue itself. Take the two together and blend, blend them together, if you will, and you have blended waveforms. So here's just a, a quick sample of different blends. When the real difference here is the duty cycle of the waveform is changing. So you can have blend one up to a pure coag waveform. Again, you see the difference in amplitude versus the pure cut waveform. On the analyzer that we'll be using in today's discussion, it does have an oscilloscope output so that you can put a scope on it and actually take a peek at to see what these waveforms look like. And here's an exam uh, example 
of full duration. And here is an example of coag spray. Crest factor, which is one of the measured parameters during a test, is just simply the ratio of the RMS voltage to peak voltage. So when you think again as to the waveform that we saw for a cut waveform, the peak voltage amplitude is a constant, hence the RMS voltage is a constant as well. So that's going to have a lower crest factor. So typically it is uh, below two, and for the FD10, typically you'll see readings of around 1.6. As you start to go to blended waveforms, that crest factor will increase as the amplitude, the peak voltage is changing based on time in comparison to the RMS voltage. So you'll see the crest factor start to increase, and when you do pure coag, you'll be at crest factors above seven. There's effect settings for many generators today in the FD10, it really is the value lab mode. And again, that is on monopolar two. And the duty cycle of the waveform is controlled for a very specialized um, waveform that the surgeon can select to, uh, to work on the patient. Many times, often, if not always, this is really a closed loop system. So the impedance of the tissue is sensed and the amount of power going to the tissue is varied depending as to what that impedance is. As that tissue is undergoing a procedure, the current or the tissue density will start to increase because of the heating factor and the generator will compensate for that. And in clinical use, um, duty cycles are typically limited to 25% or less due to power uh, considerations within the generator itself and probably even more importantly, what the, uh, the heating of the dissipative pad or the dissipative electrode would be doing and that has the uh, impact of potentially causing patient burns. So now taking a look, quick look at the IEC standard for electrosurgical generators and the steps of a PPM. So the dash two dash two specification is really the underlying specification for the development and manufacture of a surgical generator. It defines the minimum standards, such as when we start talking as to high frequency leakage testing, it'll give a maximum leakage current provided, but certainly a manufacturer can specify and rate their products for something less than that. So the specification truly does give the upper limit that cannot be exceeded. So steps for a PM. Um, all you folks know this, this is something that you commonly do. You start with your visual inspection, uh, internal voltage checks. Uh, that was something that they had you do with the force triad. That is not uh, done with the FD10 unless there's a reason to go inside the unit. Electrical safety, the REM monitoring circuit sometimes called contact quality monitoring with other manufacturers. Power output testing, where we capture current, wattage, RMS voltage, peak voltage, peak to peak voltage, and crest factor. Cross coupling, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but this is just a test to ensure that if monopolar one, for instance, is energized, there is little or no power coming out of monopolar two or the bipolar output. Especially important if there's two surgeons time sharing a generator, you don't want to have unexpected energy going to the patient um, when this is not being expected. And certainly um, from a test perspective, 
the any elital sequence should capture all of these elements. So let's talk about doing run testing. Probably more often than not, folks have used a resistive, resistive decade box to do the testing. But with an analyzer, we can capture all of this information automatically. Now, the process for testing REM is much different than the Force Triad or the FXs, any of the, uh, the Valley Lab products that you really have been used to. So no longer do you capture uh, the upper alarm of 140 ohms, look for a low alarm at five or four ohms, and also look at the 40% increase in resistance to trigger the alarm as well. With the uh, FT10 generator, this is done in RF mode, and we get there by going through the uh, incident system into service mode, which uh, on the triad used to be called debug. And we basically check four resistance settings. We start at 100 ohms, we go down to 50 ohms, and then we test short circuit, and we open up the circuit for an open circuit measurement. And you see uh, on the slide here what all the associated pass fail numbers are. And we're going to slide over now and take a look at our first video. So we're using a REM cable with the white nail, nail pin on the cable itself. We're going to go to the settings. We're going to select service. We're going to put in the same password that you use with the force triad, 423213, and then press OK. And we're going to go to RF output test. Select cut. And what we have to do now is go up to our analyzer. There is the REM output on the left-hand side, and we're going to dial in 100 ohms. come down and we'll put the other banana jack into the circuit. The FD10 goes out and interrogates actively the REM circuit at a, a frequency of about 70 hertz. So that we do our adjustments of resistance prior to making that connection. Deactivate hold values. Notice there's two ways to deactivate. One hold values, one without holding values. For testing REM, it is best to do deactivate with hold values. And you see we measured 103.6 ohms. We'll now go up, decrease the resistance to 50 ohms. We'll touch activate. Deactivate. And we measure just uh, south of 54 ohms. Now we're going to connect the two banana jacks together for our short circuit. And we're still going to see some cable resistance. You don't have to leave it energized very long because, again, it's pulling the resistive load bank at uh, 70 times a second. So 1.7 ohms. And now we unplugged open circuit. And that needs to be less than 2,000 ohms. And your REM test is now complete. So back to our PowerPoint. So let's take a look at power output testing. So when you go to the Covidian schools, they have you do the testing with a power resistor 
and a current transformer. So going from, in this case, monopolar two, the active electrode output through the current transformer, through a resistor, and then back to the patient return pad. And certainly a very viable way to do it. Uh, you need to be somewhat careful here, obviously, as you see a lot of exposed connections, so you, uh, you certainly don't want to become part of the circuit. And I will also share with you that the process that we're doing here as it relates to the FD10, as far as doing all the tests, the same process that you would use for, for any generator. So with a analyzer, rather than utilizing separate power resistors, uh, the resistive load banks are built into the analyzer itself, but we have uh, the same connection circuit. So we're going to come from the active cut output through a variable resistive load bank that we will set depending as to whether we're doing pure cut or coag or bipolar through a measuring device, which is actually the internal current transformer, and then back to the neutral or the, uh, the patient return. So when you look at the service manual for the FT10, it'll have you do a lot of these tests in the RF mode. It is a uh, kind of a couple step process doing so. You have to start your analyzer and then start the generator. For a lot of the tests using a foot switch adapter has been allowed by the engineering team at COVID COVIDian and we'll be doing demonstrations using foot switch adapters and we'll also be showing you how to do the test in RF mode. Uh, you'll find that use of the foot switch adapter saves you a little bit additional time. And again, the process that we're using here will be the same for, uh, for all your generators, your FXs, your force triads, et cetera. So here's that screen that we saw on the FD10, where we go down to the tools menu and we can go into uh, demo mode, system, service. So for use of the foot switch adapters, you would go to demo mode as you did with your force triads. Uh, with your force triad, the only thing that you had to go into debug mode, as they call it, was for ligature. And if you do all your power testing in RF mode, you go to service mode for, for it all. I mentioned earlier that the number of power tests have been reduced and here is a, a great example of that. Used to be that you did all your various settings on monopolar ones, pure cut, blend, coag, et cetera, and then you went to monopolar two and duplicated all of those tests. Over time, you would have uh, realized that the difference in the current output between monopolar one and monopolar two was maybe at best a couple of milliamps. So with the FD10 now, the only test you do on monopolar one, and monopolar one also has the uh, USB port associated to it, is a coag spray test. So let's take a look at actually doing that test. So I'm going to demo for mode first. using the run cable with the center pin removed. And as I plug in, you'll see that portion of the touchscreen quadrant light up. You don't have to worry about holding down the buttons continuously with the FD10 as you did with the triad. So back up to our analyzer, we're going to select power test. We're going to select continuous. We're going to set for monopolar. We're going to adjust our resistance to the specified 500 ohms. Set our test time.
select coag, on time, off time. We can touch on show diagram. And here is our test circuit. So we're going from the active electrode coag output to the top end of our load bank through a little jumper, through our current transformer, and then back to the patient return. We'll hit the green start button twice, and we'll initiate the test by using the foot switch connectors. So since it's coag, we will see the blue LED come on. So for five seconds on, we energize the generator. It was set for 120 watts. And there are the results of our test. So for the purpose of this presentation, we're doing everything in a manual mode. There is a, a test sequence where all this happens as automatically as possible. All the data is captured in memory. And that is uh, all the testing that you have to do on Monopolar 1. So now we're going to go over to Monopolar 2. We're going to do um, the test two ways. First, we'll show it uh, just as we did on Monopolar 1 in demo mode. Then we'll go into the service mode, entering the password, and show the steps in doing the test in RF mode. I believe I'm doing the 10 watt uh, test here. So we're looking for 143 to 223 milliamps. Covidian, of course, uses the current settings for their pass fail criteria. You'll notice that there is a um, micro switch in the energy ports. And if that switch is not energized or pushed in, uh, that portion of the quadrant does not light up. So we're going to go back to our test screen. Since we're doing a pure cut, we'll adjust our resistance to 300 ohms. Diagram is pretty much the same, so we don't have to change any of connections. We'll start the test cycle. And we measured 181 milliamps. And that is true current measurement. It's not calculated from voltage across the resistor. So back, and now we'll do the test in RF mode. I'll select pure cut. I'll select monopolar two as my energy port output. Adjust the power to 10 watts. I will start the analyzer and then press activate on the generator. So it was a little late on hitting the um, the output there to deactivate, but you see that we measured the same 181 milliamp. So Valley Lab mode is one of those special effect waveforms where the duty cycle is varied between cut and coag waveforms. We won't uh, show how to do this, but you would do this in RF mode as well. 
And rather than selecting uh, the pure cut, I would go down and select Valley Lab mode from that drop down list provided with the energy ports. So that is a couple of examples of monopolar testing. We'll switch over now and take a look at doing bipolar. So our test circuit is going to be a little bit different since we're not utilizing the patient return pad as a neutral dissipator pad. We're going to come from our active kind of the generator through our variable resistor, which we will preset through the current transformer and then back to the dissipated time. Notice again that there are two micro switches here, and if they're not pushed in, that quadrant of the touchscreen will not light up. So I'm setting for a load value of 100 ohms. I set for bipolar. There's the diagram we saw just previously. Cut is always selected for the Valley Lab bipolar modes of operation. And we measured 959 milliamps. There is a tolerance on the wattage as well, which is plus or minus 15%. You see the yellow LED light up on the analyzer showing the contact closure going to the foot switch adapter. And our current was well within the specification, the bandwidth given for acceptance. So Ligature, um, there's a few more tests associated here with Ligature than what you saw with the force triad. And a couple of different uh, resistive load values as well. With the triad, you did this in the debug mode. Uh, we will do this in the service mode as well with the uh, the FD10, because this is a test that, in an actual procedure, that tissue is going to have a varying impedance, depending on um, the current density as uh, tissue density as current passes through it, and as that vessel is squeezed together. So now I'm off to do the ligature port on the bottom right hand side. Again, entering the password under the service mode, RF mode, and I'm going to come down to ligature. Another change here where you used to have ligature test on the triad, now it's just ligature. I'm going to pull the power up to. 350 watts. Up to our operating screen. And I will say at this point, while I'm uh, making these adjustments here, that in the auto test sequence, all of this is preset for you, so you don't have to uh, worry about remembering what all the uh, the various load settings are. It's all pre-stored for you in the test sequence. So all you have to do is hit the uh, RF buttons on the generator and the start buttons on the analyzer, and everything is captured for you.
sending start button twice. I'm hitting the activate, RF activate on the generator. You see the yellow cut button come on. I'm watching that to judge when to hit the deactivate. And then coming back to the screen of the analyzer, you see that we measure 2.2 amps. Notice that the screen on the left-hand side has primary and secondary. There's two um, portions within the FT10 where they're capturing data. Uh, the secondary is the uh, measurement point closest to the output of the energy port itself. One other comment, um, you might have noticed there's no uh, lights are shining down on the uh, energy ports. That uh, the scanner is gone, now they're using RFID modules uh, within the tools themselves to activate the generator and to keep track of how often a tool is actually utilized. And there's just, a, again, a little copy of the screen test of the connections that we had during the uh, previous video. Now we'll take a look at high frequency leakage testing and also uh, include cross coupling. So if you ever visit a manufacturer of a generator, You'll see uh, somewhere in your facility a bench that uh, looks like this, and this is all part of the 601-2-2 specification as to how high frequency leakage current is to be measured during qualification. So it's a wooden bench with everything uh, pretty well laid out. Fortunately for uh, use by the biomeds and the hospitals, our only uh, requirement is to keep our leads as short as possible because if you do form coils and such in the leads, that adds inductance to the circuit. If it's laying, uh, lying, if the leads are lying on uh, metallic structures, you can add capacitance, and both of those elements would have impact on the actual impedance seen by the generator. So for high frequency leakage testing, um, everything is tested as in a single fault condition. So we will have open circuits and really just looking at leakage current, assuming if something went wrong in the procedure, what the patient could be exposed to. And we will look at both the active and the dissipative electrodes. And the maximum specification is 150 milliamps to the dash two dash two, um, or four and a half watts through a 200 ohm load. That 200 ohm load is part of the specification as well. And as we said earlier, a manufacturer does have a little bit of license over this. They can specify something less. Convidian does that with uh, bipolar where it's specified at 69 milliamps, but a manufacturer could never exceed 150 milliamps. So it could be done a couple of different ways. It could be used with um, the fixed resistors and separate current transformers and a true RMS voltmeter as we saw um, in the earlier slide, or it can be done with fixed internal resistors built into the analyzer itself. So here's an example of one of the connection diagrams. So this is, again, a single fault test. The fault in this, um, particular test or this diagram is the active electrode opens up somehow, uh, broken wire or whatever. So we're looking at leakage current coming out of the patient return through the 
from the neutral. We'll take a look at that through the current transformer through a fixed 200 ohm resistor to ground. There's some connections on the side panel of the analyzer. As part of our auto test sequences, we give you verbal descriptions as to how to set everything up. And the other thing to remember when you're doing high frequency leakage testing, everything is tested at the absolute maximum output power of the generator. So in the case of cut, it is 300 watts, pure cut 300 watts. So let's run a test. So our single fault condition here is the neutral wire is open and we measured a leakage current of 41 milliamps. When we were doing our power testing, we gave the operator the option of looking at show diagram or passing by. With high frequency leakage testing, we do show the diagram each and every time because the connections change each and every time. So single fault condition here is open cut, looking at the current through the neutral and not uncommon to see that the leakage current in the return is higher than what you would see in the active. And all of the output ports are tested in this manner. Uh, so monopolar one, monopolar two, your bipolar, and your leakage are all tested in single fault conditions. And there's just a copy of the instructions from the service manual. Um, service manual that I used here is uh, for software 2.0x. So cross coupling. A 200 ohm resistor or load is used here as well. And as we mentioned earlier, what we're really doing here is just energizing one of the energy channels and looking at the other three energy channels to see if there's any excessive current coming out of that. So again, very, um, very concerning if two surgeons are time sharing a generator, they both have instruments to the patient, and if one gentleman fires his portion, whether it's monopolar uh, one for cut, you don't want to see any energy being dissipated out of the other ports. So here's just a quick little video on accomplishing that. I'm looking at the currents coming out of the bipolar. I have my resistance set for 200. and you see that we measured less than 10 milliamps. Uh, with this analyzer, anything that 10 milliamps shows up as less than, uh, not uncommon to see that value during a cross coupling test, assuming that the steering circuit board within the generator is performing correctly. So one thing, as you see in the service manual, everything is captured on um, paper and pencil. When you're running the auto test sequence, everything is captured electronically. If you're familiar with what the output files of the Unitherm looked like previously, we have made some enhances to it where we've added in the user comments. We've added in more detail as to what the, uh, the test was, whether it was monopolar, bipolar, et cetera. And here's just a, a quick portion of what a output file would look like 
coming out of the analyzer itself. Before I uh, open it back up to uh, questions and answers, I do just want to touch on um, Meta for a moment. Tech Nation is a, a proud sponsor of Meta, as is Rigo Medical. This is a national association of biomeds. It does not uh, compete with your local chapters, uh, your state biomed associations. It complements that. And the concept here is to give the biomeds a national voice um, as we start looking at lobbying with Washington and such. Uh, probably the best part here is membership here is absolutely free. So if you go to mymeta.org, you can join the organization and uh, again, completely free of charge. So with that, we will open it up to uh, the Q&A. Great, Jack, thanks. And of course, we do have some questions that came in from attendees that we'll try to get through as many as possible, but attendees, remember you can submit your question anytime using the question feature on your dashboard. If we don't have the opportunity to ask your question to Jack and Rebecca today, we'll send it to them after the call for them to follow up offline. But first question, Jack, is please review the difference in using foot switch activation versus RF activation. All right, Becky, do you want to handle that? Oh, you can go ahead. <laughs> and I think she was muted. Um, foot switch activation. We use foot switch adapters on the rear of the generator, and the analyzer gives us a contact closure to actually energize that particular output channel. Where in RF mode, you're manually turning the generator on and off by pushing buttons on the generator. Using foot switch adapters, we energize the generator automatically from uh, contacts coming out of the, the tester. And foot switch okay. adapters would be done in demo mode and RF mode for um, RF activation. Good. Looks like the service procedure for testing monopolar outputs has been simplified some. Do you think this is true? Uh, absolutely, it is most definitely true. Um, we had the uh, we had the, the the option, the capability actually to work a bit with uh, the design team and was able to give some input on the behalf of the biomeds. Uh, one of them was to try to avoid duplicating all the testing done on monopolar one, monopolar two. So uh, uh, where before you would probably have to do nine different tests on monopolar one, we now do uh, just simply one, and we don't duplicate all of that activity on monopolar two. So yeah, very definitely has changed and cut down the number of steps um, for doing power testing and uh, should see a time saving savings as a result. Great, next question. This attendee would like to know what they could expect time-wise from conducting a PM on the FT-10. Uh, a lot depends as to how the testing is, is going to be accomplished, whether it's uh, manual mode or in uh, by use of a automated test sequence in an analyzer. Uh, manual mode, I, I, would, I would guess that it probably varies tremendously from technician to technician um, and how familiar everyone is with the circuits. With a auto test sequence built into the analyzer, you should be able to get through an entire PM, including all your high frequency linkage tests, all your cross coupling tests in 45, 50 minutes, certainly less than an hour. I have a, an attendee here that asked a really great question. Can you can the test results be downloaded onto a flash drive? Absolutely. Um, there are two USB ports on the side of this analyzer, a Type A and a Type B. 
Uh, memory sticks, flash drives, whatever with the type type A can be plugged into the uh, corresponding USB jack on the side of the analyzer. And then through the uh, controls of the analyzer, you can download that test file that captures all of the test data through the entire PM onto the memory stick in a uh, CSV format. Another attendee then, would like to know if you could explain RIM sync current and electrical safety testing. Well, electrical safety testing is low frequency testing done on most of the medical products within um, a facility. So here, there's a couple of different test protocols. There's uh, most common for hospitals is NFPA 99. So with an electrical safety test under NFPA 99 guidelines, you have, um, you measure your uh, ground continuity resistance, you measure ground leakage resist or current, and you measure chassis or touch leakage current. Um, that is all done with the power switch on the device, power switch off on the device. And then um, there's one single fault condition uh, under the guise of guide, guidance of NFPA 99, and that is to open the ground pin. Um, and that will uh, that would satisfy an electrical safety test for a generator. Other things, you're going to have um, more numerous applied parts or such. So there's some additional testing, but for a ESU generator, that would be the uh, majority of the electrical safety. The other part of that question on sync current on the REM circuit, I think they're probably referring to how much current is sourced from the generator uh, through that uh, resistance value, whether it's 100 ohms, 50 ohms. And um, I do not remember that exact number. It is in chapter four of the service manual. It, it's somewhere around a couple of milliamps. Um, but I certainly can, uh, can dig that number out if I'm answering the, the question correctly. Great, a few more came in. Let's see if we can get through two to three more. This one's a little long, Jack, so bear with me. During one of my PMs, I was able to find a chart that had all of the data for REM testing. It had various inputs. Could that chart be used for PM results? So you, you, you blanked out a little bit, or maybe I my, my hearing blanked out. Um, there was portions there in the middle that I didn't quite under, or hear well. Um, after the, he has a chart that shows what? There was a chart that had all of the data for the REM, REM testing. It had various outputs. So, um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by that. Um, if it was the FT10, there are four resistance points that you you test. So if those four points were part of that chart and measured value for that particular generator, sure that would qualify as meeting the PM requirements. Um, if it was a chart based on an FX or force triad, um, those results are that the whole test process is different than what the FT10 is as our other manufacturers as well. So Again, if I'm if I'm understanding the question correctly, it would not be applicable to an FD10 REM test. Perfect. Thank you. We'll include that one in the list that we send you after the webinar. So if you want to follow up with the attendee, you're welcome to do so. Uh, here, here's a quick question: Do you really need a wooden bench to measure the high frequency liquid leakage current? Um. You do not need a wooden bench, as was described in the uh, shown on the slide from a manufacturing test bench. However, um, when you're doing any of your um, your testing, you should not be on like an ESD mat, especially if you're using a uh, standalone resistance resistors, the power resistors, because that will add um, capacitance to the circuit and uh, 
you'll often see that the folks that still do use the uh, power resistors will typically have them mounted to a wooden board so that they're isolated from, um, from anything else that could be on the, the bench. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to use anything metal um, because if something touches something, you've, you've just become part of the circuit all too easily. I think this might be a great question for us to wrap up on. How can we get the latest testing updates for our Rigel ESU tester? For the test sequences themselves, you can um, just send me a quick email. My email address is on the, uh, the slide that's being shown now. If you're looking for firmware upgrades, you can go to the Rigel Medical website uh, under the product, select Unitherm, and then on the right-hand side of that screen, there will be the opportunity to, uh, to gain the latest firmware uh, that is provided, uh, of course, free of charge. Save that onto a memory stick, plug that memory stick into your Unitherm, do your firmware upgrade, and uh, boom, you're done. Takes a couple of seconds. Fantastic. Jack, as always, a big thank you for your time and the wisdom that you share. And of course, big thank you to Rigel Medical for sponsoring today. Again, to learn more about that company, please visit rigelmedical.com forward slash USA. One lucky attendee will have the chance to win an Amazon gift card by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey is going to appear on your screen momentarily. You do have to complete the survey to obtain the certificate. If you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Webinar Wednesday is still going strong for the next four to five weeks each Wednesday. Please follow up on One Tech Nation. Let's try that again. Visit onetechnation.com forward slash webinars to see our upcoming webinars for the next couple of weeks. As always, we'll see you right back here next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Enjoy the rest of your day.